What up, Wizards? It's Deb from The Place. Am I wearing the same shirt I was wearing yesterday? I'm not actually sure, but it doesn't matter and nobody cares. This is not a fashion channel. It's the exact opposite of a fashion channel. It's a Magic the Gathering channel. And you know what I got for you today? Got some more Moides at Carlisle Manor spoilers. Let's try some Shatterday spoilers in case you're interested. So we got, uh, what is it, like 12 cards to look at today? Not too many, but four or five of them. I think might actually be something to look at. We might actually care about them if you care about... Competitive magic. Who care? Who does that? But anyway, we have to take a short little trip through the mire of limited stuff before we come to the glade of relevancy. So let's go ahead and get started on our journey. The journey may be a thousand miles, but it starts with a single footstep. So let's look at Absolving Lamasu, Sample Collector, and Balrak Clan Basher. That's a name for a magic card, but Lamasu is five mana, four and a white for a four, three, Lamasu, that's a new creature type as far as I know. It has flying. I'm probably, am I wrong, comment section? You'll let me know. But I ain't never seen no Lamasus before. This is a 5 mana 4 3 flyer. And when an ETBs, all suspected creatures are no longer suspected. When absolving Lamasu dies, you gain 3 life and suspect up to one target creature an opponent controls. This has an ETB trigger and a dies trigger, but both of them are suspect shenanigans, and I don't really care that much, to be honest. Overall, I just don't feel quite right suggesting that you pay five mana for a three toughness flyer and limited, but there are way worse things there, and big points here, he's just about the cutest little guy I've ever seen. Just the most adorable gargoyle I think I've ever seen represented in media. There's a definite possibility that's true, but either way, all things considered, he kind of llama sucks. So let's move on to Sample Collector. Three mana, two and a green for a two, three troll detective. And when he attacks, you may collect evidence three. When you do, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature that you control. So a three mana, two, three and limited is usually not the absolute best thing, but I guess he does eat like face down dudes all day and get bigger as the game goes on. But you're not always going to be able to collect evidence and you have to collect evidence once for him to be a three, four or for him to have put that much power into play, I guess. So I don't, it's, I'm not like too impressed by this dude, but a dude I kind of am impressed by in limited is this next man, Bru Bullrack, that's his name, Bullrack Clan Basher. <laughs> Who were the Bullrack? I've never heard of the Bullrack. Am I supposed to have heard of them? Have they been on a card before? Comment section's gonna let me know one way or the other, but this guy's six mana, four and two red for a three, two Cyclops warrior with double strike and trample. And you can disguise him for three and two red. He does still follow the rule of five and limited, but at the same time, man, you flip him up and suddenly BCB's on PCP. Double strike and trample is a ridiculous combination of abilities. We've seen that before. We've all learned it together collectively. Double strike trample is just like nothing to mess with. If you have any way of modifying this dude's power, he just goes nuts. But even if you don't, you know, he's swinging in for like six. But let's kick it up approximately half a notch here and look at Cornered Crook. They went this way. It's a great name. And Tunnel Tipster here. Now, Cornered Crook is five mana. This is four and a red for a 5-4 Vaishino Warrior. Hey, what's up, Vaishino, dude? When Cornered Trickster or Cornered Crook, I'm not really sure what the uh, translation here is, but when this dude enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice an artifact. When you do, this guy deals three damage to any target. I'm just always going to like a guy that comes down and mercs another guy. If I'm being honest with myself, it's just one of my favorite kinds of magic cards. A removal spell on a body is something I'm always going to be into, especially in limited and sometimes even in standard, but not this guy. That said, I'm going to play just about every copy of this dude that I draft and draft every copy that I see in limited. Five minutes sounds like a bit too much, but he's always going to blow something up for the most part. He should have no shortage of targets in a face down format, right? And he should have no targets or shortage of things to sacrifice, I should say. There's going to be clue tokens laying around, and we've seen a couple of artifacts that do stuff when they go to the graveyard synergizing with the sort of artifact sacrifice sub theme so really like this dude five mana seems like a lot but he swings for a quarter of your opponent's life total now they went this way <laughs> i just can't get over this name it's three mana two and a green for a sorcery it's pretty basic search your library for a basic land card put it on the battlefield tap then shuffle what's the gravy investigate we're in the investigate set let's investigate how's this card not been printed before i'm not really sure it's fine it's okay, you know, Ram spell that lets you draw a card later. I'm sure there's going to be some decks that are into that, but I'm not sure it's going to be better than a lot of the options that those Ram decks already have on turn three. So is this better than Topiary Stomper? I'm not, no, probably not. So not sure it's going to see too much play, but it is kind of an interesting Ram spell. Drawing a card is something a lot of Ram decks want to do, and Ram decks are going to have the extra mana laying around to sack the clue eventually. So there's that, I guess. It's just a fun card, but... 
Maybe I've talked about it too long. I didn't think I would talk about it this long, but here we are. Speaking of ramp, though, here's Tunnel Tipster. Two mana, one and a green for a 1-1 one, one Mole Scout. And at the beginning of your end step, if a face-down creature entered the battlefield under your control this turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on Tipster. You can also tap him for a green mana. So just a dork, you know. He's two mana for a 1-1 one, one that you can tap for a green. That's kind of sometimes okay by itself. Don't love that he's only got the one toughness. But you can solve that problem by facing down a dude, which you... Usually don't want to do it in standard. I just think that we probably have like way better things in standard than this dude. But you're gonna want some ramp and limited, and you're gonna want some payoff for your face downing. So this guy's pretty good. You just put one plus one plus one counter on him, and suddenly he can trade with face down guys. Two plus one plus one counters, and he can beat face down guys. So I don't know. He's probably at least somewhat important and limited if nothing else all right we just got a little influx of cards for the day we went from 12 to like 15 so i gotta fit these in somewhere let's go ahead and take a look at presumed dead fester leech and case of the trampled garden which i think is easily the best of these but we'll start with presumed dead it's the black instant that saves a creature sort of spell for this set it's two mana one on a black for an instant until end of turn target creature gets plus two plus zero and gains when this creature dies return it to the battlefield under its owner's control and suspect it that's what we're doing this time around it suddenly can't block anymore which is kind of might be a little bit lame to be honest <laughs> i guess it's got menace so you know, if you're on the offensive, that's fine. So, I don't know. It's it's okay, but I think there's just, like, way better spells that do this because every set has a spell that does this. Fester Leech. This is actually kind of interesting. This is a single black mana for a 1-1 one, one zombie leech. And when it deals combat damage to a player, you mill two cards. You can also uh, pump it a little bit if you want to. It's one and a black for plus two, plus two till end of turn, but you only get to do it once a turn. Man. I kind of like this. I think Gnawing Vermin is just a better card because it just immediately puts two cards in your yard as far as one drops go, but I still kind of think he's neat. You know, if you play this guy on turn one, get in turn two, especially if he went first, it shouldn't be too hard. That free mill two cards is great. And then like by turn three, turn four, he's like a lot less likely to get in. But, you know, again, if you're attacking with other dudes, he's a little more likely to get in if the other dudes are more credible threats, maybe. So I don't know if he gets in twice, four mills for what costs you a single mana is okay, especially on a body. So I like this little dude. I want to talk about him all day, but that's really about all there is to say about him. As far as self mill decks go, I'm not sure that he's quite there, but he'll be a fun piece to test out. But let's take a look at Case of the Trampled Garden. Up next, this is three mana, two and a green. For a case, it's an enchantment. When an ETBs, you distribute two plus one plus one counters among one or two target creatures you control. Most awkward wording for that ever, but either way, to solve the case, creatures you control have to have at least total power eight it can be greater than that that's totally fine but once this case is solved whenever you attack you put a plus one plus one counter on target attacking creature and it gains trample until end of turn that's actually kind of huge three mana is a, a bit much for this especially considering it doesn't do too much on the front end and its sorcery speed all that but however counterpoint shouldn't be too hard to get eight power if things go right, if things do not go right, I think this card becomes like horribly bad. Like, let's say you play a guy on turn two and you don't have any other creatures. You play this on turn three, put the two plus one plus one counters on him. Your opponent targets that guy with a removal spell. Now you're never going to have eight power again. It's just not going to happen unless you play a guy with eight power, at which point this card becomes good again. But it's probably going to take you a little bit of time to regroup and actually get eight power worth of guys on the table. And until then, this card's just literally doing nothing. So I don't love that about it, especially considering the steep-ish upfront investment for not really doing anything for all those turns. All that said, though, just before we get off this card, I really need to acknowledge that the solve state is bananas. It's really, really good if you can actually get this thing solved. It is hard for an opponent to play through, mostly because of the trample. I mean, you get a Luminar Casperant, or I guess it's a green card, so a fight rigging, I guess. You get a fight rigging. <laughs> like, but a plus one, plus one counter on a guy every turn is actually, like, pretty good. But the trample, I think, is the real attraction here, especially considering to solve the case, you have to have huge boys, right? So trample's probably going to be pretty useful in that situation, is all I'm saying. I just really, really like the ability to break through stalls on this, but you kind of have to have a hot hand the whole time. <laughs> If you want to actually get this solved in a timely manner, you know, you have to not get hit by a removal spell or a wrath or in a sunfall standard, you have to not let them resolve sunfall. So I'm just not super convinced about it in competitive play, but in commander, it looks all right. Oh, and by the way, just to clarify, I'm not just doing the whole like 
it's bad, so commander law thing. What I'm actually saying here is that commander is a format where you can have eight power on the table on like turn two and a half, so this card's probably just ludicrous there. Well, let's take a look at Slime Against Humanity. This is one of those uh, goofy, interesting cards I was referencing in the intro. This is three mana, two and a green for a sorcery. Create a zero, zero green ooze creature token with trample. Put X plus one plus one counters on it, where X is two plus the total number of cards you own in exile and in your graveyard that are oozes, or are named Slime Against Humanity. A deck can have any number of cards named Slime Against Humanity. What an important line of text. What a great line of text. It's, it's on precious few cards in Magic history, but it's always a banger when you get to see it. You know, we've been seeing it, too, since 1993. You know, Plague Rats has never been amazing, and I really don't expect a card like Plague Rats to be amazing in 2024. However, important caveat, and this is like the fifth time I've read this card at least. I think I'm almost actually 10 in reading this card now. And I think I just noticed that the oozes have trample that this thing makes, which is like very good. That's not bad. It also counts the number of oozes in exile in your graveyard, which is cool. I like that. It also cares about the ones that are in exile. That's kind of neat. <laughs> you know? So if you exile a bunch of cards off the top of your um, library, for whatever reason, if you somehow pull that off, it still counts. That's kind of nice. I don't know. Altogether, it's a neat little card and it's, you know, balance the way these usually are. You can play however many you want. They get incrementally better the more you play, but also card sucks. So <laughs> good job on that. But I'm a little nervous about the trample. It makes me sweat just slightly thinking that like, okay, if my opponents played four of these, suddenly they have a bunch of huge trample guys. But hey, everybody, we're on Ravnica. And that means we got some cards. You got to tilt your head to read. Let's look at some split stuff, starting with fuss and bother. <laughs> I don't know if Winnie the Pooh designed this card or what happened here, but Fuss is three mana, two, and then a white-red hybrid for an instant that puts a plus one, plus one counter on each attacking creature you control. Bother, on the other hand, is four and then two Azorius hybrids for a sorcery. Create three Thopters and then Surveil two. That's six mana is kind of a lot for that effect, isn't it? I think three mana is a lot for the first one, but that's a bit... Uh, that's That's the point... <laughs> of split cards. I really don't like that bother is sorcery speed, but altogether this will do some cool stuff in your limited deck. And again, that's about where it ends here. Split cards can sometimes be standard playable, can even dare say often be standard playable if they do the right things at the right rate. And even though I kind of like fuss a little bit, I still don't think this is truly playable. And I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't already know. So let's look at a split card that might actually be playable. It's push and pull here. Push is one and an Orzhov hybrid for a sorcery that destroys a tapped creature. Okay. And then pull is six mana, four and two Rakdos hybrids for a sorcery. Put up to two target creature cards from a single graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. They gain haste until end of turn. Sacrifice them at the beginning of the next end step. This, this here, that's a good magic card. And yeah, just for the record, I don't like the sorcery speed on push either, but it's still a halfway decent removal spell that doesn't cost you too much mana. And in the late game, this card just wins you the game. It's pretty good. <laughs> Grabbing a Traxa and a Tally out of your yard, or you can grab them out of your opponent's yard too, which is pretty sweet. The card allows you to do that. Grabbing cards out of a graveyard is always many, many, many times better. So nice, good job, pull over there. I'm, I'm pulling for you, but either way, a removal spell that also functions as like a reanimator spell in the late game, you know I'm going to be into that. And I actually think that this one has a real chance to be standard playable in your Mardu deck. Or, and I think this is really cool, in your Orzhov deck. Or in your Rakdos deck. Or in your Boros deck. This can go in a whole bunch of different decks. And you can still cast like both halves of it if you need to, which I think is relevant and worth pointing out. But up next, let's look at what is, uh, barring any, like, mythic spoiler reloads, my favorite lower rarity card of the day. And it's Reckless Detective! It just, like, slides across the hood of a car and accidentally knocks an old lady out, and the Sarge is like, You're too reckless, Detective! And he's like, I do things my own way, Sarge. I'm a reckless detective! That's the theme song for Reckless, reckless Detective. It runs uh, Thursday nights on ABC, 8 o'clock. So, I don't know why I went into that extended bit, but I just really like this card. Reckless Detective is two mana, one and a red for a 0-3 Devil Detective. And when he attacks, you may sacrifice an artifact or discard a card. If you do, draw a card, and this guy gets plus 2, plus 0 until end of turn. So my only real gripe about this dude is the 0-3 stat line for some reason. I don't know why they did that to him. I mean, principally, I guess I get it, right? He's a 0-3, so he can block and survive against face-down dudes in Limited. And then when you go to attack with him, if he gets blocked by a face-down guy, he ends up eating them. So... 
you know, it's kind of neat for aggressive decks while still being able to block sometimes in the early game. Don't care. He would have been fine as a 1-3. Even in limited, he still would have been fine as a 1-3. And he would have been really playable in standard as a 1-3, I think. You know, if this just became a Watch Wolf, a 2-mana 3-3 three, three, when you sack an artifact or discard a card, I think that's actually kind of playable in like Oni Cold Anvil and other decks that care about artifacts. Because if you swing in with this, even as its stat line is right now, is a 0-3, and in your Oni Cold Anvil deck, you swing in with this in the early game and you sacrifice an experimental synthesizer to it, you're basically kind of drawing two cards off that interaction. So that's pretty decent and like there's a lot of artifacts and standard you can sack for this dude that do something when they go to the graveyard you know but even if you're not doing that you got plenty of junky little tokens laying around you can sack for this dude and drawing cards is really powerful but even if you don't have an artifact like i said you just discard a card and get a fresh card there might be reasons you want to do that too so this dude actually goes in a number of decks he doesn't even have to be in your artifact deck he might just be a dude that like attacks and lets you get rid of a reanimation target to get, get back later or something. He just has a couple of different applications. But don't look now, everybody. Light at the end of the tunnel, we have made it to the rares. That was a slightly longer trek through the cliffs of uncommons than I thought it would be. But here we are, we've arrived, and we get to look at Treacherous Greed together. This is one and Orzov colors, baby. A white and a black for an instant. That's cool. As an additional cost to cast this spell, sacrifice a creature that dealt damage this turn. Draw three cards. Each opponent loses three life, and you gain three life. I should say for the comment section crowd that, yeah, you can have like a Tim. Do you don't know what a Tim is? You haven't been playing Magic long enough. <laughs> but welcome, welcome to Magic the Gathering. It's just any guy that like taps to deal a damage to another target or whatever. Just anything that dealt damage. But things kind of start to fall apart, honestly, when you get into the weeds and go down the rabbit hole with this card and start talking about where it's actually good. I don't mean what deck it's good in. Again, we've already said Aristocrats is at least tempting there. And there's probably a case for like a white black x like mid-range slash control sort of deck that plays wandering emperor wedding announcement a bunch of like annoying tokens so we can get in for combat damage and use this card it's probably a case for that however what i mean is is it good if you're ahead is it good if you're behind is it good in either one of those situations you know if you're ahead you're getting in for combat damage according to the rules of this card you're getting in for damage you want to screw that up by coming down on board position Spinning the wheel and seeing what's on top of your library. I'm not sure that you want to do that. If you're behind, you probably want to come down on board position even less, right? Because you don't want to lose a blocker. And in that, like, wedding announcement, wandering emperor kind of deck, there's probably going to be a fairly common situation where your opponent's coming at you full tilt. All their dudes are tapped. They've just done a bunch of combat damage to you. Maybe you have a guy or two left and you're faced with a choice now. Right on your turn, you can leave a blocker or two up so that you can deal with the assault coming at you next turn, or you can turn one of your guys sideways for a guaranteed hit because all your opponent's dudes attacked last turn and then cast this card. Is that going to be worth it a lot of the time? Depends on how late we are into the game, right? This card costs you three mana, so if you're looking for like a sunfall off the top of your library to save your keys to. I don't think you're able to cast it that turn. That turn. <laughs> the spell does give you three lives, so helps you with the crack back a little bit, but not a whole lot starting on like turn four, turn five. Your opponent's probably just going to laugh and kill you after you cast this card. So I have a lot of reservations about this, despite the fact that, you know, it's a pretty good refill <laughs> that also slaps your opponent in the face and gives you a little bit of a, you know, soda pop. So I think it's okay. I do, but when you actually get into like real world game applications, I... I'm a little worried about its performance. But all right, everybody, top three cards of the day right here. We got Undergrowth Recon next. I imagine a lot of people are really excited about this. It's three mana, one and two green for an enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, return target land card from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. <laughs> Holy crucible of worlds. That's, that's actually pretty good. Again, you know, I think I said this earlier, but green seems to keep getting uh, bonkers commander stuff. And <laughs> Here we are again, having that same conversation. Especially considering you got like fetch lands in Commander, like a whole bunch, you just play them all and you use this. That's really sweet, man. And like it works in standard for what it's worth. It works with like all the fetch lands we have there that just happen to gain you a life, which is kind of neat. Altogether, cool card to have in standard, man. I'm not sure really what we end up doing with it there. And I will acknowledge the card is fairly slow, you know? <laughs> like you either have to have fetch lands or self-mill yourself in some way um 
to actually use this in the first place. So that's, you know, it requires some deck building concessions. But aside from that, you play this on turn three. And then assuming that you have a land to get back from your graveyard with it, on turn four, you get that land. It comes into play tapped, though. So you won't actually feel any effects from this card until like turn five. And that is not good. <laughs> I, really, I think that's actually very stinky. I don't know, man. <laughs> I, I want to like this a whole lot and be like super stoked over it. It's a really, really cool effect. I like that. But I like the design of it. That's cool. But as far as the actual like playability competitively of the card, I actually have some doubts. But I'm willing to be wrong. But next, let's check out Lazav, Wearer of Faces. This is two mana, a black and a blue over at 2-3 Legendary Shapeshifter Detective. That's great. And whenever he attacks, you exile a card from a graveyard, then investigate. And whenever you sacrifice a clue, you may have Lazav become a copy of a creature card exiled with it until end of turn. So I'm pretty sure what this card is trying to tell us all is that we can have, on turn three in standard, a Tyranaxorex that is attacking... <laughs> crazy it doesn't even have to be a tier nags rex i was just trying to pick like the biggest meanest ugliest dude i could think of off the top of my head that doesn't care about an etb trigger before for the record you won't get an etb trigger lazav's already been in place so that's how that works but either way you could just it could be like a galta or galta and maverin fane that's a big dude but you won't get the attacks trigger just for the record but it's still an enormous guy attacking on turn three which is all i really care about i also get to do callbacks for both otherworldly gaze and gnawing vermin both those cards getting a lot of press in this video but they're great with this thing right you can cast either one of them on turn one to set up the lazav or if you have to wait you can cast lazav on turn two and then on turn three you still have the mana to cast either one of these to set them up and still pop the clue another thing i should probably at least like point out to clear up about this card because I've seen a lot of like misreadings of it online or maybe people just aren't like initially getting this on first read. But I've seen some people say that it sucks that you can only like copy a guy once or whatever. And that's not true. That's not how the, actually not how the car works. Thankfully, once you've exiled a creature from a graveyard with it, that creature then goes into a bank. <laughs> just look, picture it that way. That creature goes into a bank and then Lazav can copy creatures in that bank for the rest of the game. Just anything that he has exiled at any point in the game, he can then copy whenever you crack a clue. So yeah, the card actually works exactly the way you want it to, which is awesome. You can cast that otherworldly gaze on turn one, turn two, cast Lazav, turn three, get in, get that clue, crack it, becomes a Tyranax Rex that you hit with the otherworldly gaze. And then turn four, you can do it all over again, so long as there's still a card in your graveyard or you can get a clue and crack it in some other way. But oh, everybody, we got a brand new card that wasn't here last time I reloaded Mythic Spoiler, so let's take a look at Case of the Crimson Pulse. This is three mana, two, and a red, and when it enters the battlefield, you discard a card, then draw two cards. Worse sort of tormenting voice, <laughs> bitter reunion. To solve this, you have to have no cards in your hand. Once you've solved it, at the beginning of your upkeep, discard your hand, then draw two cards. Huh. Okay. It's actually not god awful, I guess. Three mana up front for an effect that you really don't even play in your deck at two mana nowadays is not the best thing in the world. And then you have to completely empty your cards of hand. Your cards of hand. Empty your hand of cards after you've just drawn cards, too. That's, that seems difficult. So, got to have a bunch of, like, low-cost stuff. But obviously, obviously, this is amazing once you get to top deck mode. And I hate top deck mode. You know, if there's turns where you end up with, you know, two lands in your hand because this drew you three cards in a turn. Well, it drew you two and then you drew your card for the turn. And two of those cards were lands. Well, suddenly you can't really use this card the next turn. It doesn't do anything. And that kind of sucks. But, you know... Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. You just the mouse in the mouth. You just drew three cards. So I don't know. I'm back and forth on this. This is the first time I've ever read it. So my thoughts aren't really gathered at all, but you know, my thoughts aren't gathered on basically any card I talk about in spoiler season, you know, so what's different either way, anything that keeps you from the pain and torture of top deck mode, I fully support, but I actually I just hope it's good. That's all I'm going to say. I have my doubts. But up next, let's look at the big mythic, everybody. It's Ansrag, the Quake Mole. This is four mana, two, a red and a green for an 8-4 legendary mole god. And when it becomes blocked, you untap each creature you control. After this combat phase, 
There's an additional combat phase. You can also pay seven mana. That's three, two green, and two red. And Anzrag must be blocked each combat this turn, if able. Another thing I want to clear up about this, um, this, this can trigger like many times in the same turn. This can trigger like five times in the same turn, especially if you hit him with something that gives him like indestructible for the turn or something like that, then suddenly... <laughs> Suddenly, you know, this guy can just um attack, 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 which is just so silly. It's so silly, dude. But the thing about this card is that um even if you never actually use his ability, whether that's his activated ability or maybe his actual ability never triggers and you never get another combat set, whatever. It's a four minute eight four. There's literally no downside to this card whatsoever. Yeah, he dies to removal and blah blah whatever. Whatever, man. This is still um. A ridiculous card. <laughs> like, come on, dude. First of all, Mole God. We get behind that. On this channel, we get behind that that creature type. <laughs> but also, eight. <laughs> eight power for four mana. And this dude, he's not like the ancient one. You know, he has, oh, you got to jump through a bunch of hoops and stuff. I call him a two mana eight eight, but you got to do stuff. And I don't want to attack. You just got to. Poke and prod until I get off the couch and I'll do something. Not this guy. This guy's ready to go. This dude's not only ready to go, but like he does the thing and he's like, you want me to do it again? Let's go. <laughs> you know. After that one, he's like, "You can we go again? Let's, this dude's just like fired up all the time to get attacking. So, love that. In the, in the meantime, there might be other creatures on your team getting in too, by the way. I haven't even mentioned that yet. So I don't know. Just really excited about this dude, man. And honestly, I'm not really a gruel dude. I like to smash, but you know, you've been on been watching me on this channel for nine years and how often have i been like i'm a gruel man i'm a gruel man da -da 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 -da. never i've never done that now i have i guess <laughs> but this is the kind of thing that'll make you sign up to smash some stuff i may not be a gruel man or a soul man but i am a mole man gonna be playing this literally i'm i never leave my house i just, when i do walk outside i'm like the light so you know it's actually does describe me very well i like this guy i'm I think I'm out of bits. And that must mean it's the end of an SBMTG video. But join us tomorrow for more cards, not bits. Although I'm sure, come on, there's going to be bits. Just let me know how you felt about all this stuff. I had way more to say about these cards than I thought I would. I was like, ah, 12 cards. I'll go in the office and knock that out. No, I've been in here for an hour and 31 minutes, apparently, recording this video. That's so much. I wonder what the actual finish time will be. I wonder if people are going to see like a 40 minute runtime and be like, I've had a lot to say about these crappy cards today. No, a lot of these cards are actually sweet. So now it's time to let me know how you felt there, stranger. Just go down in the comments section. What am I doing? Uh, and let me know how you felt about these cards. I've just repeated myself. Just do that. It means a lot to me. I actually care about your opinions. I really do. I read your comments. So go down there. Let me know how you feel about the stuff. And then also do the YouTube things on your way out. Hit the like button. Hit the like button before you hit the lights hit the light one of those yeah sure it works either way i gotta get through this i gotta get through this just hit the subscribe button if you want more of whatever i'm doing right now and you can also check out the patreon just a dollar a month to get started we have higher tiers if you want to support but all it really takes is a buck to support the channel like crazy you have no idea it supports it like crap it's just a lot it just helps so much if you even just pick a, a pick a pitch a dollar into the pot i can't talk right now I can't do it. Just uh, do, try to do a Patreon link in the description. It helps. But anyway, that's all I've got for this one. I apparently have to get out of here because my English is getting more bad by the jiffy. Um, I love you guys, <laughs> and I'll see you guys tomorrow. I'm Deb from The Place. Thanks for watching, Wizards. Spread love and be kind.